Okay. So I'm going to share the screen now. Mm, this is the one. There we go. So um, I will share this recording. So um, if you don't want your little face to be seen, you can go on video, but otherwise, I mean, you can like turn your video off. Hmm? All right, so let's have a look at the quote at the bottom. Sorry, the print is quite faint, at least it is on my laptop. But this, if you just bear this quote in mind as we go through the talk, it will maybe help you piece things together. <clears throat> it's a quote by Dr. Deepak Chopra. He's an, some of you might have heard of him. He's an Indian MD and also Ayurveda doctor living in the States. Um, he's written so many books, runs fantastic programs. And he says, Ayurveda is the science of life. And it has a very basic, simple kind of approach, which is that we are part of the universe and the universe is intelligent and the human body is part of the cosmic body. And it's very much going to be, you'll see, looking at our place in the universe, looking at the like building blocks that are in each one of us that are the same building blocks that run through everything else in existence in the universe and how those building blocks work. And so an Ayurvedic physician and I will look at how they're working in you to treat you. And we can start to understand how they're working in us when we know our Ayurveda type. And then we can look at, um, you know, when we understand that we are part of the universe, so we're governed by the same universal laws that Ay Ayurveda understands, then we're kind of empowered also to take care of ourselves. Hmm? Um, to sustain and um, support our own health when we have this new understanding of who we are and how we're made up. And this is what I'd like you really to take away from these um, talks. So this is really the first talk of the three is really, you know, we're looking at um, how Ayurveda works and why it's got to what is it that's a little bit special? You know, what can it add to us? Um, what can it add to our understanding of ourselves? And how can it empower us to take care of ourselves? So first we're looking at a little bit of the history of Ayurveda. And I'd like to just break this word Ayurveda down um, for you. So Dr. Deepak Chopra has said it's a science of life. So we can break Ayurveda down into two Sanskrit words, Aya and Veda. So Aya is life and Veda is understanding or knowledge. Okay. So Ayurveda is knowledge of life, understanding how life works. So understanding how this universe that we are part of works, as Dr. Chopra was saying. What is it? <laughs> So uh, fundamentally, it's the ancient medical system of India. And it originates from the Indus Valley. So the Indus Valley is up in the northwest corner of India. If you look on a map of India, um, there was a very um, evolved civilization there. A lot of the yoga teachings and practices that we do possibly probably originated from there. Many of us think these days that Ayurveda came from Kerala because we go to Kerala for our Ayurveda treatments, but it's not so. Um, it originates from this ancient, um, you know, quite sophisticated civilization. How ancient is Ayurveda? Well, I have another bullet point here. You'll see the teachings and practices are first found in the ancient body of knowledge known as the Vedas. So we've got the Rig Veda, the Yajur Veda, and the Vedas, these texts um, are believed to have been written about 500, 600 BC. And yet this knowledge um, predates that, very much predates that, because for a long time in India, Wisdom was passed down orally. There was an oral tradition of passing on wisdom. So I've even seen um, some estimates that it's about 40,000 years old, even this wisdom. 
and yet it was so sophisticated. The classical Ayurveda texts um, that we use these days are maybe from the second century BC. And there's even a surgical text there. One of the texts is on Ayurvedic surgery. It's so, you know, it, it's a, they were sophisticated civilizations and cultures. And so it's an equally sophisticated system of medicine. And it's informed all other major medical systems in the world. So there's a lot of trade in the ancient world going on with India. And um, as we know, with goods, ideas and knowledge was also transported. So it's believed that Ayurveda informs and predates traditional Chinese medicine, Tibetan medicine, Persian medicine, and the medicine of ancient Greece, from where, you know, from which our medical system, of course, is derived. So far, so good. Any questions? Okay. All right. Again, answering the question, what is it? How does it work? It's the functional system of medicine. And this is really very much its distinguishing factor. So even a lot of the complementary treatments, what we would call the alternative um, medical systems these days, there is this, um, you know, there are other systems of functional medicine, but so often, even if you go to a homeopath or a herbalist, they treat your symptoms, right? We have a headache, they treat the headache. We have, um, you know, we have weight gain, they treat the, they have their formula for weight, okay? Um, in Ayurveda, we're looking at function. So that means we're not so much treating symptoms, although we will give something to alleviate acute symptoms and, and discomfort. But the main concern of the Ayurveda practitioner is how is this body functioning? How is this body functioning when it's in its state of health? Okay, this particular person in front of me, how would their body be functioning in their state of health? And how is it functioning now? So what are the innate strengths of this particular person, their body, their mind, and what's happening now? What are their innate weaknesses? And um, you know, what are their um mental tendencies we'll learn in a moment how the ayurveda practitioner can determine that but if you sit in front of the practitioner yes they'll listen to your personal history your story quite acutely so they'll want to know you know your whole medical history because that is probably how you got to where you are now and then also we'll then start to assess through observation of your skin, of your eyes, of your um, uh, sound of your voice even, of the texture of your skin. So through touch also, all right? Even sometimes maybe through smell in some cases, depending what the condition of the person is. And then with specific diagnostic techniques, um, so pulse diagnosis, as you see here, tongue diagnosis. We'll look at the nails also to help assess the condition of the inner body, as well as the tongue and the pulse. And they'll do a lot of kind of investigative work, even into like the quality and nature of your stool. And that tells us a lot. You know, I did a retreat with one Ayurveda um dr indian man years ago in spain and he said the best education for the state of our body is to look at your poop every day and <laughs> see how it's doing okay but and i made us very clear um on um you know how to interpret stool as well so all these kind of things we will ask about and then treatment is through lifestyle so Knowing your nature by asking you certain questions, the Ayurveda practitioner can begin to understand really a little bit more of who is this person who's in front of me, okay? What is their um, real nature? What is their metabolic makeup, okay? And from that can determine what would be a balancing lifestyle for this type of person. And lifestyle is really fundamental in Ayurveda. 
So we're very clear that this is one of the foundations because it's likely to be that lifestyle and nutrition have set things off in balance, you know, started the imbalances, maybe at the root cause often. Living um, against our nature, living in ways that challenge our particular metabolic nature because no one's taught us to understand it and what works for it and against it. So treatment will be by a lifestyle and dietary prescriptions according to your type. And then for symptoms, body treatments. The body treatments are wonderful. And it's not a massage. We use herbal oils and pastes and poultices um, for all kinds of conditions from heart disease to neuralgia, back pain, bone and joint problems. It's really wonderful. And the herbal therapies. Herbs prescribed according to your type as well as according to your symptoms. So a uh, herb for headaches might work for one person, one herb for headaches, but then for another type, another kind of herb for headaches would be better. Maybe you would tend towards a slow metabolism and a little bit of a cold type. So you, are not want, you don't want a cooling herb. Maybe you have a headache, but it's a different type of headache. Okay, so then again, you need a different type of herb. So in this way, there's a real quite an in-depth investigation into the nature of your condition, which is probably very much related to your own metabolic makeup. And then also Ayurveda and yoga, they're like sister sciences. They overlap, they empower each other. We're doing Ayurvedic yoga in class. But as part of a treatment, you might be prescribed yoga postures, particular breath, mantra, sound therapy, very much a part of treatment and meditation. Okay, so here you have it, another quote by Dr. Chopra, which maybe you understand now. So the first question an Ayurvedic physician asks is not what disease does my patient have, but who is my patient? And by who the physician doesn't mean your name, but how are you constituted? And for me, this is the most fantastic thing about Ayurveda. And we all know that, for example, there are so many diets out there, right? Some saying eat carbs, some saying don't eat carbs, some saying high protein, some saying, uh, I don't know, high fat, is it? Isn't there one where you're, you're eating quite a lot of fat or something? Um, and some will work for some people and not for others. Some actually are really good for some people and really bad for others, according to your nature, your constitution. So in Ayurveda, we would never have like um, one solution for all. We really look at the individual and we prescribe according to your nature, according to we want to give the building blocks understanding life, understanding how these building blocks of the universe work. We want to give the building blocks that are going to optimize your metabolic function, basically. And that will build and bring harmony and balance into the body. And so that you have your natural state, which is one of health and the body's intelligence. Because remember Deepak Chopra at the beginning, he said the universe is intelligent and we are part of the cosmic body. So we have that universal intelligence running through us. So you create the right conditions and the body can correct itself. I'll just qualify that a little bit that we see in Ayurveda six stages of disease. And it is said that in the later stages, maybe five and six, that probably, and I'll say probably because we all know, um, you know, spontaneous remissions of all kinds of conditions, spontaneous healings, but probably it's just going to be actually really will be symptom management when it gets to a certain point. But Otherwise, you know, we can really engage the body's intelligence so that it can heal itself. So, you with me? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, how does it work? What are these building blocks? Um, there's prana. There's the life force, okay, that runs through everything in the universe, runs through us, generates very much our health. And also there are five elements. So Ayurveda is a five element system of meditation. And it sees that five elements make up everything in this existence, not only in the material world, 
but subtly as well. Okay, in the like not so gross physical forms. So like our mind, our mind stuff. Also, maybe we can say has the five elements running through it. And the five elements are earth, water, fire, air, and we say ether, although that is more like the space that contains the other elements. And each element, as we know, has specific attributes. Without studying Ayurveda, we know some of these. Water is wet, <laughs> fire is hot, okay. Earth can be dry or wet, but it's heavy, isn't it? So each element has specific attributes and the elements combine in different proportions to make form. And it's the way they combine, it's according to those proportions that a form has its attributes, has its qualities. Does that make sense? So I've given some examples here. So for example, chili peppers, all right. We know there's maybe a little bit of liquid, a little bit of juice in the flesh of a chili pepper, but not much, right? So not much water element. But you bite into it and it's fiery, right? So there's a whole lot of fire element in it. And it's hot inside, yeah? So a solid, sorry, hollow inside. It's hollow inside. So it has a lot of the air element in it. And then tomatoes, they're all juicy and watery inside. So a lot of the water element, they're also red. So we say they have that fire element in them. Okay, they can be a little heating. Take an oak tree, so sturdy and solid, and it's really heavy, the oak wood. A lot of earth element in it. It's not got a lot of movement because it's got that solidity compared to especially the bamboo, which is hollow inside, right? So it has a lot of the air element in it and it moves. That's one of the attributes of air, that it moves. And so the bamboo with its air element in will move. Yeah, it's great, right? So when you think about it, it's real common sense, isn't it? It's just that we've never looked at our foods and, and the nature this way. And it's the same within us. These, air, these elements combine within us in similar ways and to give us specific attributes, which we'll have a look at in a while. And so my last point here on this page is this gives Ayurveda a unique and powerful understanding of the world. It's looking at the fact that elements combine in certain ways and that each element has certain qualities, attributes. And so we can really understand the nature of a thing in knowing this. So I've given a little summary here. Don't worry for a moment about this word tridosha. The elements combine in all beings, including human beings and all plants and minerals in the universe. And through the dominant attributes of those elements, Ayurveda can, uh, through the dominant attributes of a thing, Ayurveda understands what are the dominant elements here. So by knowing chili pepper is hot, we know fire is a dominant element, okay? Understanding the dominant elements, Ayurveda can determine the unique nature of a substance or an individual, and then know how to work it, know what its strengths are and what to give it for its strengths, know what its mm, challenges might be, hmm? know what its tendencies to be a little too much of one thing and not enough of another, like too much fire in a, in a substance and not in a human being with a lot of the fire element, you know, it will know that certain situations are gonna make that fire go up. So it gives it a great understanding and it knows what will make the fire go up, okay? And we can talk about that in a moment, which actually is something I didn't cover the last time. So it'd be nice to bring that in. The elements combine to create the following three Ayurveda types, or we call them doshas. Being three, it's three doshas. So Ayurveda, very much these are like some of the cornerstones of Ayurvedic practice and Ayurvedic understanding. So we call it a tri-dosha system. Okay. 
So the elements that are kind of mm, most uh, having most impact in our environment, the ancients saw are the air, fire and water elements. And so each of these three types dominated by one of those elements. All right. And the, these types actually also run not only through the human species and not only governing human species, but all animals and even the seasons and the times of day. OK. And to a degree. Um, yeah, I'll come to the foods in a moment. Let's have a look at the first one. Vata dosha is the first type. And um, we say in this type, the air and ether elements are dominant. And so the attributes of a type, which is dominated by these two elements, are dry, air is dry, rough. You see what air wind does to a stone. So if you've been on Dartmoor, you see this rough, cold. It's cold, okay, unless the fire is applied of the sun, for example, in our environment. Subtle, right? It hasn't got a dense substance. A mobile, it moves. That's vata dosha. Pitta dosha, okay, fire element is, do is dominant. Even though it is said to be fire and water, the liquidy part of this dosha actually is more oily. So. And the attributes are hot, sharp, light. Okay. So fire is light, fire is hot, fire is piercing or penetrating, right? If I burn this um, piece of paper, the fire is going to penetrate across it, isn't it? If I go on there. <laughs> um, so it's penetrating. Okay, rather than moving, it just kind of it needs a substance to penetrate, doesn't it, for it to move. It's liquid and it's oily. Okay. And then thirdly, lastly, we have kapha dosha. So in this type, the earth and water elements are dominant. And if you think about, we've all played with clay as kids, I'm sure. We've all played with mixing earth and water. And think about what you get from that. It's cool, right? You make something very cooling. It's heavy, isn't it? Earth mixed with water is really heavy. How much movement does it have? Not much at all. If it does move, it's going to be slowly. It's dense. It's soft also, yeah? Clay. We say it's static, or you can say even more stable, you know, it's very different to air, which has that mobile quality. It's cloudy. You mix some um, earth and some water, and the water goes cloudy. And it's gross. It's kind of got that heavy solidity to it. So we'll look towards the end in how this later as you know how this manifests in people. Any questions at this point? Is it clear? Yeah. So okay, let's just go back a moment. When we are conceived. Hmm? Um, at conception, our Ayurvedic type is formed, all right? And our Ayurvedic type is, in most of us, one or a combination of two of these doshas, two of these types, okay? So even though it's a tri-dosha system, there are more than three Ayurvedic types, actually, all right? So we are either one or a combination of two of these types. So we can be vata, pitta, or kapha type. We can be vata, pitta, vata, kapha. We can be pitta, kapha, okay, or kapha, vata. And then also, few rare individuals are what we call tridoshic. So they have equal amounts of all three, but they are rare. The more balanced we are, 
the more we might seem appear to be tridoshic, okay, the more imbalanced we are. So even though we have a dominant type, all three of the doshas are at work in us. So whilst Ayurveda is a functional system of medicine, it looks at fun managing the function or optimizing function by understanding how the doshas work in the body, how all three doshas are operating, because we have all three doshas within us. They are what we call the functional managers of the body. Between the three of them, they're taking care of everything, okay? When all is good. So how does that work? Well, vata dosha, air and ether takes care of all the movement in the body, all right? Pitta dosha, governed by fire. Fire moves across paper and transforms it into something else. Hmm? So pitta dosha takes care of all the transformational functions in the body. So we talk about digestive fire and the capacity of the digestion to break down foods and transform them into other substances for the body to utilize. And then kapha dosha, think about clay, earth and water, and we build things out of it. We make structure out of it. So kapha dosha is the manager of structure in the body. It's from kapha dosha that we get structure. Okay, I've put a little note in the left corner of the screen. The thing is, dosha, and this is why the um, lifestyle and the education of how to take care of yourself, to understand your type and to know how to sustain balance in your type is important because dosha literally translates as that which is unstable or sometimes it's translated as something meaning a fault, meaning it's likely to go faulty, all right? That which is unstable, it's affected by so many outer and internal influences. So the doshas are the functional managers of the body, but they're likely to go out of balance, okay? So understanding which doshas are dominant in us, so even though all three doshas are working in us, we will have some or one or two usually which are um, governing the nature of our metabolism and the nature of our, our psyche also. So here we go. This is where the external influences come. So even though the doshas are made up of combinations of elements, you know, that affect us, those elements permeate the whole of existence, as we've said, in varying combinations. And so the doshas are at work in the cosmos. The doshas govern the cycles of time, okay? During the day, nocturnal, diurnal cycles, seasonal cycles as well. And um, yeah, so. <laughs> Each season, let's have a look at the diurnal and nocturnal cycles first. So the different times of day are governed by different doshas. So we can think about a very obvious one is that midday, when the sun is at the highest and when there's more light in the sky, then this is, of course, what do you reckon, when pitta dosha is dominant. The fire element is dominant, so the pitta dosha is dominant, okay? Think about the qualities of that type made up of earth and water, the heavy qualities. So when the sun starts to set, so maybe from six o'clock to 10 o'clock in the evening, when the body and the earth, the body is quietening down, getting ready to sleep, so is the earth, so is the nature, right? So that quality is supporting sleep, heavy, not so much movement, steady, stable. Okay, so that's uh, um, evening time, right? And then also, you know, we have the times when naturally there's more um, movement. So maybe, you know, in the early hours of the morning, often we wake up, that is the vata time of day, between vata time of night, to between two and six, 
2 and 6 a.m. is the Vata time of night. So that's why if we have, if we tend to be a Vata type, or if we've got a lot of stress, or a lot of movement in the mind going on, nervous system's a little agitated, we might find we wake up in the middle of the night, in those hours, maybe around three o'clock, anyone? And then it's difficult to get back to sleep because there's too much movement in the mind, because there's too much vata up, and it's being influenced by that vata time of day. So if we have a lot of vata in our system, and we're not islands, we are affected by our environment and the cosmos. We are part of the cosmic body, remember? So then it's like there's more of that influence coming into us. So we need to be aware with our lifestyles how to keep this inner being, inner body pacified, inner doshas balanced, so we are not adversely affected by the activities and the movements and changing um, frequencies of the doshas in our environment through the cycles of the day and night and also through the seasonal cycles. So to take the fire element again, summertime, obviously a pitta season. Hmm? By the way, in India there are six seasons. So in some places you'll read um, about a, a six season you know, the doshas across six seasons, but we live in a four season, right? Four season world in the in this northern hemisphere. So um, I'm working with Ayurveda with a four season concept that summer is pitta, okay? And then think about autumn when the leaves start to dry. Hmm? The um, Grasses start to also dry, hmm? the plants. So there's that dryness in the environment. And that is one of the qualities of the vata dosha. Hmm? It's also getting colder, hmm? vata dosha. So this is a vata time of year. So as we transition towards this time of year now to the autumn, winter, autumn and early winter, you can check it in yourself, particularly if you discover that you also have actually a lot of vata, then it means that that might be the time when the vata within you becomes too high because you're being influenced and affected by the vata in the environment. That means maybe you'll find there's too much movement going on in the mind hmm? or maybe too much dryness in the body, which can affect your stool, which can create constipation or hard stool which can create maybe dry skin being a little worse than it usually is, this kind of thing, okay? Spring, by the way, is a kapha season because there's a lot of moisture then in the earth to support the coming through of the shoots. Late winter is the same. Also a lot of moisture and this kind of latent, you know, waking up under the earth, everything's starting to stir and wake up in mm, preparation for spring. That moisture, that dampness, you know, is um, reflected within our cells when there's too much kapha, when we haven't been taking care of our lifestyle, and we succumb to those kind of congested respiratory bugs and viruses. Mm. So the transitional times of the year, everyone, by the way, are times when we're thought to be most vulnerable in terms of our health as well. So we can say, you know, at the, as we meet for autumn and as we meet for spring. And the cycles of life. So I wanted to put this in that, um, you know, Ayurveda reckons, recognizes that life and nature is cyclical, including our own lives. And so our own lives also, the different stages of our life are also governed by various doshas. So when we're growing, when we're making new structure as kids, kapha dosha is dominant. When we're young adults and we need to have a bit of fire in our belly to go out and make our way in the world and to be able to deal with raising a family, and we need that energy and that drive, Fire elements dominant, pitta stage of life, right? And then say as we approach 60, we're reaching the vata stage of life. And remember vata, dry, 
cold, subtle, so not a lot of structure. So we see people start to lose tissue mass, body mass, hmm? muscle dense, density and the you know, muscle tone and strength. We see the skin becoming drier. Yeah? And even in extreme cases, we see maybe people in old age start to become looking a little emaciated, hmm? particularly maybe if already they were a vata type. Hmm? Because one of, we'll look at the types in a moment, but if you think of vata is air and ether and a lot of movements and not much earth and water making structure, making form, these are very slight figures already, not a lot, not a lot of tissue density, not a lot of body mass. And so in old age, it can get even more so because it's a vata stage of life, it's a vata type. Brittle bones, dry bones, these kind of lovely things that can visit us as we get older, but not necessarily, by the way. If we know how to antidote through our Ayurvedic understanding, Ayurveda teaches us how to antidote all these effects to sustain our health, our mm, strength. Okay, so here are the, yeah, this is good. <laughs> here I have three very different looking women, though the top two maybe not so. I found it difficult to find a very purely Vata lady. But if I was to zoom in on this lady at the top, she has very long fingers. Okay, so there are particular attributes of this vata type, this type which is dominated by, governed by the um, air ether element. I've already said they don't have a lot of body mass, right? And so the bones tend to be long and slender and the joints might be prominent, but they're not really big and broad. Yeah? So the face also might be quite thin and long. And they will have those tendencies towards dryness because that's one of the attributes of vata, of the air and ether elements combined. They will have the tendency maybe to, you know, that's also an attribute is hard. So maybe um, stiffness, like a little bit of rigidity or inflexibility in the body. And also, by the way, when it's in excess, so also we see this in old age, huh? inflexibility in the mind we see sometimes. Hmm? Not only in old age, of course, but we do talk about getting set in our ways, right? Um, and dryness so brittle when when um, the dryness is too high, when there's too much vata there through the lifestyle or through the effects of the um, environment, then maybe the nails are becoming brittle, the hair and even the bones. Dryness can be with the stool. Maybe there'll be a tendency to constipation. And because there's not much tissue, so there's not much heaviness, there's not much solidity. And because of this, another attribute of vata is this movement and mobility. Then there can be a lot of movement in the mind and the nervous system. So when this system goes into, gets into trouble with their health, they're likely to get into trouble in um, conditions which have symptoms of vata excess. I hope that makes sense. So a vata person can get a pitta condition or a kapha condition. So any upper doshas can go out of balance or into excess, but it's more likely that it will be the dosha of our metabolic type, of our nature, our Ayurvedic type that will go into excess and cause trouble, okay? So nervous system disorders, anxiety, insomnia because there's too much movement, okay. Neuro degenerative neurological diseases perhaps later, not necessarily, right? But if we're not living in balance, if pro for a prolonged way we live in a way that aggravates the vata over a long period of time. Um, Strength and resilience wise, I mean, we all know these people, yeah? They tend to be the most delicate. They're very sensitive because there's not much, um, they don't have my, you know, the barrier is thin, okay? There's not much tissue there. So they tend to be very sensitive. 
and also um, the most vulnerable in a way, physically, um, I don't know if emotionally, mentally is the right, vulnerable is the right word to use, but definitely physically, you know, they have perhaps the least resilience, the least endurance, um, the most likely to get debilitated. So in terms of exercise, they really have to be discerning. Yeah. So hopefully that gives you some clues about Vata Dosha, but positively, you know, very creative because of this movement in the mind, full of ideas and visions, all right? The problem is, though, because of all the movement, seeing them through. <laughs> Okay, so then they need a bit of fire. So Vata, Pitta combined is a very, um, they have traits that are very kind of prized in our society, in our modern society. Whereas maybe in ancient India, you'll come to see it was more the Kapha um, qualities that were prized. But Pitta, here's this lady, I chose um, like a sporty image because the pitta they'll often have rather than this long, slender, thin frame, more a moderate frame and quite toned musculature. Yeah. And they have this fire so they can be quite athletic, motivated, competitive, driven even when it comes to excess. Because of the fire emotionally, if there's too much heat in the body, a little bit irritable, critical, quick to lose their temper, hmm? but we can all be quick to lose our temper, right? So it's not just Pitta. But their stress response is likely to be in this direction because of the dominant fire element. Having the dominant fire element though, also they digest the best, okay? They digest very well. When they're young, they can digest more or less anything. <laughs> But as they get older, like all of us, they have to kind of rein it in a little bit. Of course, tend towards more inflammatory illnesses because of the fire. Um, and um, prone to infection. And in terms of endurance, they can, um, you know, they have more endurance than their vata. But they can burn out, okay? So they can really let the fire take over and then burn out. So it can be a little bit like a, you know, boom and bust thing with them. They can crash also. And then we have the Kapha Dosha. So you see this lovely lady, you know, naturally curvaceous, Beautiful moon shaped face, round face, usually big eyes, also the kapha type. And you'll see here the bones are bigger, right? The shoulders are naturally broader. This lady is never going to look like what we see in the fashion magazines of the models. It's not her nature, but this is her natural shape and this is her beauty. This hair is going to be thick and glossy. Um, the skin, maybe, um, so kapha has this unctuous quality. So the skin will be less likely to dry. And as they age, these are the ones that have the least wrinkles. <laughs> okay. But that earth and air element, it's heavy, right? It doesn't have much movement in it. So their metabolism tends to be slow. It's not weak, but it's slow. And out of balance can be sluggish, so they can tend towards congestive illnesses, um, lymph congestion, like um, congestion in the arteries, right? Weight gain, water retention because of that water element and the earth holds water as well, right? Respiratory congestion. So that's your types. And I've just made this note here. So when an Ayurveda physician inquires into who you are, he's looking into the dominant doshas, which doshas are, what dosha, what, what dosha or doshas are you by nature and which ones are manifesting as dominant right now, okay? 
Okay. And so that means which ones are triggering your symptoms, which are causing you to have symptoms. So let's not treat the symptoms. Let's pacify those doshas and bring them back home and make them happy again. Okay. So it looks at the doshas created at your birth and then the mm, activity of the doshas created by your lifestyle diet and maybe your life experiences. Okay. So really, that's more or less as much as I wanted to say today, because I think it's a lot of information and it gives you a little bit of the overall picture of how Ayurveda is working, how it looks at a human being, how we might be bringing ourselves into balance by making sure we're continually antidoting any excess of any of the attributes of the doshas, particularly the doshas which are dominant within us. Does that make sense? Yeah, great. And then I just did this little bit about the yoga because we are doing Ayurvedic yoga so often in our classes. Um, I thought I'd just mention something, you know, where the Ayurveda ties in with the yoga. So we can adapt the yoga practice according to the individual. So if someone comes for yoga therapy or comes from a one to one with me. I might give a yoga practice, well, I will give a yoga practice taking into account their dosha. Also, we can take into account our dosha when we choose which type of yoga we are going to do, if we have the knowledge. So, for example, if you have a lot of pitta, a lot of fire in your system, you're likely, particularly if the fire is kind of high, you're likely to be drawn to a Bikram class or a hot yoga class where, yeah, let's sweat it out because that drive is there, right? But it's exactly what this person doesn't need. So by the way, when we're out of balance, we'll go towards what creates more imbalance generally. When we're in balance, when we're balanced, we're going to choose the yogas or the lifestyles or the foods that nourish the balance. I think we all know it. When we're stressed, we go for the junk, right? When we're feeling balanced, we eat well. It's like this. So Pitta would be better with a practice that engages their mind so they have something to work with, like a very alignment-focused practice, like Iyengar. Whereas Vata Dosha, which needs to take it a little more easy, calm all that movement, maybe a slow, steady, flowing breath awareness class, soft flow, or the Shivananda, the style of practice we're doing in our class, very nice for Vata. Holding still, not a lot of movement, working with balancing the breath to balance the nervous system. And Kapha is going to be the one that really doesn't want to move very fast. <laughs> but those hot classes, those power yogas, you know, taking into account also your age. So when we're younger, they're going to be good for that Kapha. But if you're reaching your Vata stage of life, then you're not going to want to go into those classes also. Also, as women, let me mention that when we come to menopause, that's when we're going from the Pitta stage of life to the Vata stage of life. And those doshas start to fight for control. Pitta doesn't want to let go. Vata wants to assert itself. And when air fans the fire, we all know what happens, right? And so we're getting things like night sweats, hot flushes, all these kind of symptoms of menopause. So we can do a lot through Ayurvedic lifestyle, simple herbal formulas to balance those symptoms. And then post-menopause to really make sure we don't get too dry and brittle boned and um, you know that we stay juicy and nourished and in the mind, in the brain, as well as in the body. So seasonal specific yoga, I'll shut up soon. <laughs> seasonal specific yoga, we've been doing in the morning yoga classes. Some of you are just joining. And the people that have been with me since the beginning of the year and have been doing this, I think they'll agree there's a strength coming from it. Um, you know, so in the spring season, late winter, spring, we were doing a very different practice to the practice we're doing now. It's a kapha time of year, so we were doing a lot of standing practices, a lot of um, creating space and energy here and moving the energy up to counter that heaviness of the kapha. Whereas now in the pitta time of year, 
We want to stop the heat from building up in the internal organs. So a lot of twisting, compressing the body, a lot of um, forward folding to compress the organs, a lot of relaxing the effort, you know, to counter that intensity of the fire element through long exhales. So this is how we work with a seasonal specific Ayurvedic yoga. Age specific, I've mentioned a little bit already, you know. And I just wanted to throw in the lunar phase yoga because we, Ayurveda for women, it's just kind of, it's an ancient knowledge that's not so much in the clinical texts, but it's there, it's been there um, historically and traditionally in the communities, living in alignment for women with the moon, the healing power of this. And this knowledge is kind of being um, reclaimed, reawoken now. And so we are adapting our practices and teachings also according to the phase of the moon as women. And that, I believe, is more or less as much as I want to say right now, apart from to introduce you to my new little soon-to-be-launched website, which has been a mission to get sorted, Heart of England Ayurveda. So I'm kind of relaunching my business. And my mission statement is that we are, I am, Ayurveda is unlocking the door to a life of health, vitality, joy, and empowered living through the combined ancient wisdom of Ayurveda and yoga. And so in the Ayurveda, this diagnosis, lifestyle, nutrition, herbs, and body treatments put together for your type, for your needs, your stage of life, your condition, and also one-to-one -one coaching Ayurveda yoga coaching, taking a whole look at your life and drawing on all the tools, courses, classes, workshops, retreats, and even a teacher training coming up, as some of you know. So that's me finished. It's a lot of information I've thrown at you. I hope you could follow it. I hope it makes sense. Um, do you have questions? Anyone? I hope so. Let's put it in the gallery anything oh hi Sharma it's Linda hi Linda I thought, hi I thought it was really good when you said um find out which dosha is manifesting right now because sometimes I get a bit obsessed as to what dosha am I um but obviously we're all changing with time of day the seasons our age but we've still got the inherent one that we're born with maybe yeah. yeah absolutely absolutely so the dosha your natal dosha we call it your natal type we call it your prakriti in sanskrit so your natal type the dosha your ayurvedic type that is formed at conception you are that type for life mm. but we are still you know um affected by all three doshas yeah so you're absolutely right linda but it means that if you're kapha you're likely to be more affected or more likely to go off balance at the kapha times of day and the kapha seasons kapha stage of life not so easy to say because we're kids we're generally in our you know mm -hmm. flourish glowing with health most of us as kids not always but generally Mm -hmm. um, so maybe like pitta person, vata person, more likely to get symptoms of um, vata excess in the winter, and a pitta person more likely to get, you know, whatever weaknesses they have in their body due to their natal type, more likely maybe to flare up in hot conditions. Mm. Does that answer your question? Yes, yeah. great. Thank you. All so about really, balance, though. <laughs> it is about balance, and it's about staying super alert, having your antenna up, and using that inquiry we take into our classes all the time, using it in your daily life, you know, so we don't wait until we're laid up. We just see, wow, I'm feeling a little bit like this, you know, a little bit, um, Maybe I'm not sleeping so well right now. I'm waking up in the early hours of the night, right? So how is my lifestyle aggravating my vata dosha, perhaps? Or how can I pacify vata dosha so that I can start sleeping at night? 
as opposed to starting on some horrible medication to help us. Mm. How can I create balance rather than just killing the alarm bell really is what we often do when we just take um, symptom focused medicines. Thanks, Linda. Good question. Anyone else? Any questions? Um, when you're doing the um, seasons, I was thought oh, that must be spring because of all the movement. So I was quite surprised. 